and um, I'm one of your slug subcommittee representatives. Patrick is another one who's standing there. And we welcome you to the Sydney Linux user group for October, right? We're not in November yet. Um, there'll be another one next month, and it looks like we have a pretty good schedule tonight. Um, well, they can't hear you because you don't have a microphone at the moment. Um, anyway, Slug is a community-run organization. If you're interested in it, um, you should help out. Um, if you want to slug to be at your local market, like I think Patrick's obsessing about at the moment, um, just do it. And that's awesome. Um, if you haven't been here before, uh, toilets are back around the way um, you came, past the lifts. Um, there's Google Guest Wi-Fi here. You Sign on as Google Guest and you're done. Um, other things, um, linux.conf.au is in Canberra this year, so it's only a short hop away. I highly recommend it. Yes, next year, 2012, January 2012. 13. 13. <laughs> this always gets me. Anyway, um, there is a Linux LA, uh, LCA coming up in the next January. Um, in Canberra. So I highly recommend you attend. There's little cards out there that tell you all about it. It's an awesome conference. Definitely come along. Um, no. They're not in on the list. Sucks to be them. Um, we're a subcommittee of um, Linux Australia. Linux Australia is our parent foundation and they provide a whole bunch of insurance and stuff so that we don't have to do any paperwork anymore. Um, I don't know when the elections for subcommittee come up again. Should be March, right? Yeah. So in March, you can boot us all out and re-elect yourselves if you want. Um, so that's everything. I might start with. Um, I might start with Mark, whose presentation I've got up here. Um, this mic is working too, so I'm going to give you that one. Thank you. You're only talking short. This is short. Okay, so this is a quick talk. Hopefully this is... Does anyone know exactly what that is, just from the number? Is there anyone who knows that number? Okay. Who hasn't seen that comic? You're looking at it now. Okay, so who here is not familiar with xkillcrushdestroy.com? This is one of the problems we have in IT, in some cases more so than in other places. You don't see plumbers arguing about exactly how big a screw should be. They have fairly decent standards and there's only like four to choose from. So we have in IT a hell of a problem with all of our standards and in particular, one of my pet peeves, lightning talk, is the fact that you haven't picked this standard yet. So this is the actual standard. It is an RFC. It is an internet st proposed standard is its current status. And I'll jump very, very quickly straight to it. That's approximately now. The beautiful part about this standard is that it is unambiguous. It is sortable. If you just sort that in the locale of C, it will just sort automatically for you. The other wonderful thing that I am seriously endorsing is that it doesn't actually get questions about what time zone is it, what is that, and so forth. The fact that we have either the capital Z to mean UTC or plus 11 colon zero zero, you have no questions. Someone can look at that and say, no, it's applying this standard. Here's exactly what it means. End of question. There is another standard you may have heard of. Can anyone know the ISO number? There's a four letter, four number ISO standard, 8601. It is a standard that's very similar to this, except like all high level ISO standards, these things get voted on by the entire United Nations. So in order to get a yay vote from the UN, you have to cater for everyone's whim. So 
moving away. In the ISO standard, that's optional, that's optional, that's optional, that's optional, that's optional. That's not quite optional, but it can be optional if you're in German. So we don't like it. This is an internet standard, and almost none of that is optional. They occasionally say that you might want to get rid of the T, but please don't. So you do that everywhere, and you have a standard that works, that's unambiguous. And if I go to my next slide, you can do stuff like this, for example, in HTML. That there is a strict 3339 compliant timestamp. But when you have that in your browser, it says three hours ago. So assuming it's three hours from now when we're in the pub, it says three hours ago, but there's still the actual time there, unambiguous, you're not going to get confused. And when the program shows it again, say for example, this is your email client, and it shows your timestamp, it'll say yesterday, or it might say 17 hours ago, or it might say five years ago, but the timestamp in the actual code doesn't change, and it sorts much, much better, and you don't get the nonsense problems about exactly when was that. And I think that's my last slide. So any quick questions? It's a lightning talk, so I don't think there are any. File names aren't the place to put a full timestamp like that. This here is for inside your data. If you have the file names, then you could get rid of the colons and perhaps the, you could get rid of all the punctuation. But the trouble is putting in the time zone, the Z, it can work. This is RFC 3339. It's meant to go everywhere you display a time. So. I would keep as much of that as you could unless your file system absolutely prevented you to have it. I mean, that'll work as a Unix file name. That's a perfectly valid Unix file name. It's a perfectly valid name for your file on Google Docs if you feel like it. Uh, you're li the on there is only one character that, it that is only two characters that are invalid in a Unix file name. And one of them is actually not strictly invalid. The forward slash is the path separator, and the null character you probably shouldn't, you should probably try to avoid using it, but you can if you have to. So everything other than the forward slash is valid in a Unix file name. What's the plus and a colon mean to bash? If you type echo space that, enter, you get that. But the shell doesn't care about that. The shell, if you echo that in a shell, you will get exactly that without variation. In, in any POSIX compliant shell. Say again? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> I think we're at the time limit. I'm happy to have an argument about VFS. Anyway, that's my little lightning talk. Hopefully we have someone else coming to take this mic off me. I, I missed the Linux Conf timer. Um, the next person apparently is Rob, and the two marks are going to argue about <laughs> so time I, at the pub. So how do I cancel this? How do I just... Um, do you have a slide? No. Oh. No. Oh. That might be a press control shift N. Yep, understood. There you go. You have a web browser. So what are you talking about, Rob? Amazon Web Services, apparently. So um, it uses the little nodule thing rather than the um, touchpad. So Rob, are we talking about Amazon Web Services? Um, can we give a hand together for Rob while he sets up? Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, oh, and thanks, Mark. We all good, Rob? Okay, Rob's going to like broadcast his password to the world. 
Um, um, you unplug the one from the camera, uh, from the desk. Yep, you can pull that one out. I'm just going to be talking about AWS, which is uh, Amazon's web services. I'm just going to be talking about Amazon AWS, which is Amazon web services. Um, where to go? Some content. There we are. That be it. You know, people, if you bring your own laptop, it's much easier. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'm talking about Amazon AWS cloud services. Uh, so if you sign up, it's pretty much free for a, a couple of servers. Like you've got 750 hours a month or whatever for free on the uh, micro instance. And basically all it is is um, they offer a number of services, but the one I'll be mainly talking about is the EC2, which is uh, Elastic Cloud Computing, which is basically a server in the cloud. So you sign up and you get this access to this and you can go in here and wait a bit. And you can basically create your own virtual machines in their network. And here I have one that I've created earlier. Uh, I did have. Where'd it go? All right, let's create it again. So you just basically, to create an instance, you basically just say create an instance. You come up here, you say which machine you want to create it as. Uh, the star indicates that it's it's uh, covered by the free, uh, free tier, as they call it. And you hit select, and you say, okay, I'm going to create that. And continue. And I forget a name. Now, it, when you create one the first time, it asks you to create a uh, key pair. I've already created one, so this is my uh, key pair. Uh, create a security group, which is basically just a, the firewall sort of thing. Just using the default quick instance. And that creates your instance. So here you have a machine that's running in the network. And <coughs> it's just like VM in the network. You can access it remotely uh, using the key pair that they gave you. And after a while it starts up. Um, <coughs> so to connect to it, you can just use straight uh, SSH if you want to, or remote desktop if you've got it set up. Uh, you can also just right click here and say connect. <coughs> and use the Java one. You don't have Java? Right. <coughs> so you can still do it from SSH, but you need the key, which 
I'll have to go and grab, but I'll work on, move on to the next bit anyway. So you can also go in here and see your usage under your account. And basically you can use this machine to do whatever you want. It's, you have direct access to it. You can go to it and uh, <coughs> log into it, change its settings, set up a web server on it, whatever you want to do. And you can see down here that uh, I've used a couple, everything was still under my free usage. And you can see that I've run it for 24 hours, but it's still covered under my, my free usage. Um, Sorry. If you power up the machine, it counts that as an hour, whether you use five minutes of it or an hour. But it's uh, like, first of all, it's under the free tier at micro instance, and even if it wasn't under the free tier, it's like 20 cents an hour. It's, it's not expensive. When you sign up, you get access to, you get the free tier, which is like, is you sign up, doesn't cost you anything to have this much usage. And that much usage gets you uh, 750 hours of a micro instance, which is the smallest instance type. And they're only like 12 cents an hour or something like that. And um, 750 hours is pretty much enough time, enough time to run it all month, one machine all month. Uh, <coughs> You can, or of course, you could run a second instance and you'll just be clocking through that time twice as fast. It all counts on uh, compute units, so it's not, it's not anything to do with uh, the actual CPU or the actual time up. Uh, it's like uh, compute units for, you know, a micro instance might only be one compute unit, a bigger machine might be multiple compute units or something like that. Um, <coughs> so if I go back to, And you can, of course, uh, connect to it, change it. Uh, what do I go on to? You also have what they call uh, S3, which is the storage. So S3 was the first one that they offered, which is basically just a, a key pair storage. They were using it for web services, such as you want a uh, image to be stored on the machine. You want an image available on the net, on the internet somewhere. You don't need a server. You just put it up, upload it to S3, and you've got a URL that you can access it to access it by. Uh, so if you go in here, this is one I uploaded earlier. So the S3 is arranged in buckets. So this is my bucket. And in my bucket, I've got a file that I uploaded. And if you click on that file, show me more detail. Properties. So if you click on that file, this is the URL that will link to it. And that's up there. I've made it public. So anybody can go to that URL and grab that thing. Um, but they're all stored as key pairs. So you have this key name, and it results in that file. Uh, they don't really care what that value is that's stored under that key. It could be a file. It could be a value. It could be a whole uh, VM image. It doesn't really matter. Apparently, it can go up to like terabytes in size. Uh, but for the... EC2, they use uh, an EBS, Elastic Block Storage, which is basically just a uh, block device. And that's much more like a hard drive. Um, so if I go back and have a look at my EC2, you can see then that you've got uh, your volumes. And this is the volume that makes up that uh, instance that I have running on the other side here. And you can see that, uh, so this instance, if I click on it, you can get all the further details down the bottom. It's really quite simple to use. Uh, this is the, domain, the uh, domain name. 
so you can access it from outside. It assigns a new one every time you start it. So this obviously represents the IP address, but the IP address is going to be different every time you start it up. They have uh, an elastic IP, which is basically you set up your own IP that's a permanent IP that you would then forward on to whichever machine you're using. And it, it can uh, load balance that, that uh, IP. So you have all the traffic coming in by one IP and you've got 100 instances and you, you know, share the load out amongst those 100 instances. Uh, you can also take snapshots of these machines so you can restore them back to a particular point. Um, apparently NASA used these. That they, uh, for the Mars rover, they download a whole bunch of data, they fire up a couple of hundred instances, process the data, and then shut them all down again. So it's, 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 that's its ideal usage, that you're using it for a temporary sort of load that you want to just get things done, and then you put it aside. Hackers also use these sorts of things to uh, break keys and that sort of thing. They fire up a thousand instances, run it against, you know, breaking piece of people's passwords or something like that. And then when they're done, shut them down again. And that's about it, really. I just thought it'd be a nice thing to just let people know about it. Yep. Uh, not too much, just played around with it a little bit. Fired up a machine, I logged in. I, um, like I said, you need the key to log in. It, it generates the key, the key pair itself. Uh, when you first log in, when you first create the instance, the first, it's realized you don't have a key pair stored. So it creates a key pair and sends you the private key as a downloadable file. Um, but you can create your own keys and upload it the other way around, which I think is probably the more secure way to do it. This set, send the private key as a downloaded file doesn't sound too secure to me, but <coughs> I suppose it's okay for a quick sort of trial. Um, yeah, so I logged in, I played, I changed a couple of settings saw that I, that they save the settings because once you terminate the machine it disappears entirely it doesn't exist anymore so the the idea is that the you would create a a running machine and then from that running machine you would create a uh, image which I don't have but let's say say for instance I go in here and from this one here you can create an image and once you create that image, that image is then available to create another instance. So you basically create a clone of that machine as another instance. It'll get a different IP address, but other than that, it'll be exactly the same. And then you can create a thousand of them and you know, do whatever you want to do with them. Any other questions? So John's going to be demoing his Raspberry Pi. I think you've pulled out the wrong one there. You're supposed to be going into one of the cables. At yes, but it's not coming up on the video. So have you connected it to the other HDMI? Yep. 
Um, I'm I don't see it up here. Yep, give that a try. No, no, but it was, we had it up on the screen, so it's, it's... Oh, okay, okay. It, well, we tried to do it, but... You've turned it back on? Yeah, it's like back. I'm not seeing it. No, you had it around the right way. Because I can I was on that screen up there. Okay, I guess so.
so this is also last week. Right? This, what have you done to the Velcro tab on the back? So on the back there is a Raspberry Pi. Um, this is a Motorola laptop, which That's was made for a phone a couple of years ago. For the Atrix, isn't it? Yeah, for yeah. The, this is in fact the Atrix version. There's a couple, okay. or at least it's the US Atrix, whatever. Um, I think Droid Bionic, actually. Uh, so all this is all this Motorola box is is a USB keyboard mouse connected to a USB hub, a HDMI monitor, and a battery. And so it's got on a little pop out that I've actually removed, it just has a micro HDMI plug and a micro USB plug. Um, just cable adapters, uh, uh, adapt that into the uh, Raspberry Pi, and I have a, another laptop. Um, prior to the Rev2 Raspberry Pis, you actually needed to do a whole bunch of cable hacking because this is in fact powering through a USB device port as opposed to using the post port intended to power which was, there's a whole mess of discussion there as to why that's incredibly evil and bad, but they still modified it so you can do it. Um, it happens to be really nice for this because in total, I think this might be ten, six bucks of adapters off eBay, uh, six bucks of random cable, bucks of adapters off eBay. The case, thank you, someone, someone who works just over there, on this level who just happened to have a MakerBot on their desk. Um, and I was like, hey, does anyone in Sydney have a MakerBot and can print me one? The response is, I printed you a prototype, have a test. Which people I work with are awesome. Um, and yeah, the laptop was 60 bucks. So the whole thing cost maybe 120, 130 bucks. Uh, if you really want an ARM laptop, go buy one of the new Chromebooks and run Linux on it. It's already been documented how to do it. but if you want to mess about playing with Raspberry Pi in a method that doesn't require a desktop setup, this is shiny. Um, the weirdest thing about this is the way you turn it on and off is by unplugging the HDMI cable. <laughs> it, it detects whether or not to turn, the this unit detects whether or not to turn itself on by Well, thank you both to John and Julian, um, who are doing cool stuff with Raspberry Pi. Um, how much are the Raspberry Pi now? They were like 35 US and... Except that Raspbian, which is what I'm running on that, hasn't been updated to the new firmware. And although it's relatively trivial to do, I just couldn't be bothered to have my play. So it's still running as well, it's just me. Um, Chrome really doesn't like running. You know, with less than about zero IP. So it didn't automatically pick up the extra one? No, you, you need a specific firmware, and current, the firmware is on the SD card, and that's. Most of the stuff out doesn't have it. They just this week, I think, did a firmware revision that actually is usable by both Raspberry Pis and is actually quite safe. So what you'll probably see is in the next uh, update of all these images, it will be the 512 meg system to get 512 meg around, which is the SD system and all the stuff. So the actual two meg system maybe is in some other hard hardware and that's why oh, it's different from this. So ARM hardware doesn't have all the magic audio detection and things into it. And it's horrible, and if you know Linux trouble developers, they hate it. Um, so, we put it in the Yes. Okay, well, thank you, Julian. Um, so, yeah, we have, we have one last point from Raspberry Pi. I think that yeah. uh, Broadcam has finally released open source everything yeah. to do. Well, 
No, no, maybe this is not a really... So, the Linux graphics developers take this for risk that they claim it isn't actually using it for open source. The kernel guys I know are having much more reason to do it because every single, every single time something is made an ARM call in Linux, it turns out that the graphics call does tell you that it either has its own ARM call or it actually tries it. And so some things, including a C compiler, run on the graphics processor's ARM call. And the graphics guys aren't happy with that. But I think the kernel guys are biased in that the entire kernel call is being open with no binary logic is what we really want to. So we can really compile that and get it clean. It would be nice if we had the code for the ARM call, for the um, GPU's ARM portion. That's not happening. Do we have the projector up the back? So, so the difference is that large segments of what we do traditionally call the graphics driver are actually implemented on the chip, on the GPU side of things. And it's as though you're dealing with a GPU with, it's almost as though you're dealing with a remote device that's just over a very fast connection as opposed to a local graphics processor. It's, it's weird that. And I can understand the argument, I just think the kernel guys are right, the graphics guys are wrong in this case. It's a step in the right direction. Yes. But at the very least, I think everyone agrees it's still better than any other, any of the other uh, ARM system on the chip being Is that not exactly a high level? Yes. Input 5 is. That it's ox changes the one up there. Bring your laptop next time. Okay, um, so Patrick's going to give a talk about slug next year, and I probably guess how you can help. Yes, um, slug 2013. It's been a slow progression towards. Uh, like up to your. Is that better? Yep, that's oh, better. It's been a slow progression. The last slug community-based activity was at the 2011 Sydney Education Expo. We haven't participated in any community-based activities since, and it was a while before that that we were at anything else before that as well. So I'm not quite sure why. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> Can you hear that? There is some very interesting commentary going around about, uh, but different lugs have different views about what happens. I remember at LCA, one of the lugs regularly attracts about um, two people, and they were pleasantly surprised when a third person turned up one day. That's pretty impressive <laughs> when you think about the percentages increase. But, and some others sort of totter along for a while on you know, a very small handful, five or six. They're lucky if they get up to 10. And then usually they get four or five that turn up and then it ends up in somebody's garage or mother's basement, I suppose. Um, we tend to have more, but then again, Sydney's awfully big as well. Melbourne has a fairly good turn up. I think that what we need to do is look at what it is that causes people to attend, what it is that causes people to feel that they don't want to come. Uh, obviously, the reasons people can't come. But we sort of average around about 20 at a meeting, which is okay, sort of, but for a city the size of Sydney, I don't know that it's actually a really good number. Um, yes, that's right. yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I, and I, I think there are lots of different reasons. All, most lugs are having the same experience that we are, which is that they were bigger and now they're smaller. Uh, there's probably a large number of reasons for that. I don't know what the mailing list is like, Tim. Do you have any idea? No. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. 
There we go. In 2013, there'll be a number of community events which we could participate in. The principal amongst these is the uh, Software Freedom Day, the third Saturday of September of each year, which means we've got, what, 10, 11, 11 months to go for the next one. The site itself has some really fantastic information about setting up a Software Freedom Day event. And they also keep track of what everybody's doing and ask for people to give feedback as well. There are other options such as uh, an install fest at a community location such as a university campus. The last one I went to was a very long time ago. Oh no, sorry, Wollongong about four years ago, I think it was. And before that, I think it was uh, at, at one of the agricultural colleges, Helsin, not Helsin Ag, whatever university is out that way. You can also have a presence, and this is a different way of looking at, at the process, uh, going to a community event such as Newtown or, or Marrickville Festival, which either of those two would probably be quite receptive, uh, given the nature of the general community in the area, the same at Summer Hill, all of those sort of limp-wristed, inner-city, trendy, coffee drinkers and then also one option as well as we've talked about before is the North Rocks computer market. Uh, Shrida and Rob and I went out there uh, a few weeks ago just to have a look. They were very busy and they obviously had space for extra people. Uh, I have written to them three times now and they are probably waiting for me to mail them something I would imagine because they don't seem to respond to emails. So I'm going to uh, look for another way of communicating with them. It's not, this is not an exhaustive list, but it is a way of doing a few different things. And it answers some of these. Um, why should you participate? So it's not why shouldn't you participate, but why should you participate at something like this? One thing is it's actually quite a lot of fun. Uh, Rob came to the uh, Education Expo uh, uh, Sridhar as well. I don't think anybody else here came to the Education Expo, no. There was about eight of us that went uh, over two days and that was fantastic. Really, really interesting. A lot of fun. And the level of interest in FOSS is far greater than you would imagine at a place like that. Huge numbers of parents coming up and then teachers coming up as well, talking to us about what it was that we had because they, we had a whole collection of monitors, laptops, uh, sitting on a desk running lots of different things so there was lots of things flashing around that caused people to turn away from the boring presentations that people were giving and look at what's on all these computers with these flashing stuff happening and that generated a lot of interest as well as going out and literally strong arming people to come over and have a look telling them don't be scared come and have a look at this we're friendly and and they would and nobody called the police um, the other thing is it's a social activity as well. So you get to meet other people that you may A, never have met or B, very rarely meet and you can hang out with them doing something very interesting. It also helps promote SLUG as, an, as a uh, community organisation and it contributes to the community's awareness of Linux as an easy to use operating system. So it gives people the ability to speak to somebody which is not most people's um, experience. They usually don't know somebody that uses Linux. They might have heard about it. They are probably using an Android phone and still don't know anything about that either. But it gives people in the community an opportunity to actually come and speak to somebody face to face and talk to them and ask questions about this obscure thing to them. It also promotes a greater awareness of the FOSS ethic within the community as well. And that's something that's really useful. Once people start to grasp the notion of of ethics, they then start to think about what they do in their general life. Most people think ethics have nothing to do with them. What they, in fact, are really saying is that they're unaware of their own ethics. Once you start promoting the ethics behind free and open source software, it causes people to think about what they do generally and whether they want to participate in a particular style or a particular, uh, particular ethical uh, practice from different uh, companies. And it also gets uh, gives you the opportunity to do for someone else what somebody did for you, which was to help you learn that there actually was cho a choice out there and different choices as well, and, and that those choices are actually practical and useful choices to them. Now, what does it take for this to happen? It's 
the same as anything. People. Nothing happens without people being involved. That is true. It really only takes for people to be involved and to join in. Any community group, it's the same thing for any community group. It only, it only manages to achieve and only manages to exist because of the people that are in it. Once those people no longer are in it, it just doesn't exist anymore as a going concern. So the difficulty is overcoming these inertia. It's far easier to sit down and do nothing than it is to get up and do something. It's far easier to sit at home and watch TV. The current episodes of the animated Iron Man are pretty good, actually. There's also the fear of not knowing anything at all. So if you don't know anything, how can you actually help out? What can you do? You can't do anything. Or there's the other one too that comes with that, which is I don't know enough. So you might know a bit, but you don't think that you know enough. And my experience is often that, that people in general know far less than anybody in this room does. So anybody here is able to promote free and open source software. Anybody in this room is able to speak to somebody else in the community about it. And there's a great probability that they know nothing at all. So there's often that anxiety people have that they don't, don't know enough. I remember the very first training course I ran um, uh, was actually for uh, the sexual assault team for the New South Wales Department of Health. And I kept thinking, oh, God, you know, like I know a bit, but I don't know enough. And at the end of the day, I realized that everybody else in the room apart from me and the other presenter knew nothing. That was a surprise. Went to the police academy, ran the same training course down at Goulburn, they knew nothing as well. And we kept thinking, oh, at least we'll, they'll come up with some interesting comments or a bit of information. No. So you'd often be surprised that you most likely know more than almost anybody else standing in a room with you, other than this room. And there's the other one, if you can't do it all by yourself. And that's true. You can't do it all by yourself. And that's the good thing to recognize. You can't. And nobody expects you to. I certainly don't expect that anybody who decides that they want to join in or participate in something that we're thinking of running next year does it all by themselves or gets left to stand there on the Todd to take complete responsibility. Yeah, that's not really a very cooperative and friendly way to run something. So you don't need to be able to do it all by yourself. And the last one's the best one. What if it fails? Well, yes, it could. We could run a... Uh, we, we could get a, a desk at uh, Software Freedom Day and nobody comes up and talks to us. We could go to Marigold Festival and nobody pays a slight bit of interest. I really seriously doubt that that would in fact happen, but it's possible. It could be a complete schmozzle. Um, at least you did your best. <laughs> now I sound like somebody's parent. Well, I am somebody's parent. It, the only way of achieving something is by getting out and doing it. The only way of getting it done is to get up and start doing it. So it may well fall apart at the seams. It may well be a complete schmozzle. It, all of those things are true. You may not know an awful lot. All of those things are true, but they're not things that should stop you from participating or joining in. The fear of failure. You know, it does fear. It can, it can be awful. I been I've been involved in some things that didn't work well at all, particularly when I was on stage once and it just wasn't funny. <laughs> it was pretty awful and it was supposed to be a comedy as well. Um, if you're interested, give me a call or email me and I'll talk to you about the sort of things that we, that we would be expecting for anybody to be involved in at any of these sorts of things. It is aimed at helping you to just expand your horizons a bit be involved a bit more, feel good about something. And, and in large part, if you don't enjoy being there, then there really isn't a good thing to do. And so my aim for anything that we would run is for it actually to be enjoyable and to be fun. Because otherwise that ruins half of the activity if you can't enjoy what you're doing, even if you're busy. When we were at the um, Education Expo, I was exhausted. So was Sridhar and Rob. They're absolutely knackered at the end of each day. But it was good fun, wasn't it? It was really, really interesting. <laughs> well, that was only because Shredar was doing the OLPC side of the stand. <laughs> so seriously, if, even if you don't know if you really want to be involved, you're just not sure, just talk to me anyway. And I'm quite sure that I can convince you that there's something useful that you can do and that you'll have a good time. Thanks, everybody.
Well, I lose one hand and then I can't present. Okay. Well, um, sorry for dressing up like this. University obligations before and after the party here, so just had to do it. Academic people don't understand casual clothing. So um, I've been doing a PhD not for myself or somebody else. How often does one get to do so a PhD for someone else? Um, I've, I've been involved, better to say, in a PhD, which is around... Um, free and open source software, and I thought that I could give a monthly report of how the PhD is going on, and it would be a whole lot of information from the scientific um, literature around this issue, and it would be interesting to know what actual researchers and students are doing in a field. And, you know, usually academic work um, somehow relates us to the business infrastructure behind us, which provides the money in the end, which is useful. And it is one of the best ways to promote free and open source software using academic literature. So, um, issue of this month is perceptions around fast adoption by businesses in the end. So, any kind of organization who is going to adopt any kind of free and open source software, they have a kind of procedure of adoption and some factors affect that adoption and there are some issues around it. So this is a kind of picture-based, fast, non-boring, non-academic presentation of that, of those facts. Um, first, what, what we get here is in what many different ways do they get to actually adopt FOSS? So what, what you can see here is using um, OSS case tools um, or many different things. In here it is not really useful to talk about this because you're all aware of the different kind of things. One, one main thing is, is Linux desktops, Linux servers behind the infrastructure, which is a tough decision to make, whether we use Windows server, Linux servers. Um, and then you go all down to Eclipse subversions, um, inter integrating or extending Hibernate, Google Web Toolkit and stuff. And then, oh, MySQL would be one of the big choices. And then this list was like five pages. This is just an example of it. So. Um, the first thing we have to pay attention to it is that in what way that organization is going to adopt FOSS. We'll come back to this later because it really affects the decision. And um, same thing here. We've talked about benefits like 100 times around, and it is like very, very obvious reliability, security, quality, performance, and all those. But um, what is really important is that that part of increasing collaboration inside the system, because you know this issue of knowledge management is today's issue in organizations. And one of the main ways that everyone is finding innovation inside organization is by bringing the small teams together and you know, kind of hoping that um, collaboration between teams go up. And wikis and FOSS tools really increase that collaboration because of the essence of FOSS. Um, Usually, when this picture comes here, this right pops into our mind that, oops, game over. We have a lot of benefits. You don't have anything. And, you know, this is very, very important to know that this is not always true. I mean, we in, room, in, in this room, we all know the benefits because that is like bold in our minds. But what happens in the business side is that when you say, are you going to adopt FAST? They say, what is that? Say free and open source service. Did free? Nope. No. Nope. We are paying for something that we are sure about. And the next slide, that drawbacks really come into the question. And you see that not false adoptions are all over the place. They are not. 
mainly because security risks, it's nonsense, but they don't understand it because the essence of being open source brings the false idea of security problem. And, and, and that's a perception problem because we, by now we all know that we get more security patches mm, when a lot of people see the source code, it is less likely to be a security hole in that code. But this is very difficult from a perception point of view because mm, people tend to hide something to make it secure. And this is so difficult to tell someone that you should just expose it to be more secure. And then we have user friendliness. Yeah, we, we have that lack of user support. Yeah, lack of support, but not lack of user support. It was in the literature, so I just copied. I was not in a place to change academic literature. But we have lack of support somehow, because community support not always helps businesses. It helps, but not always. And especially when that CEO or CTO is making the decision to, to take 100 servers to Linux, he, that, that would not count on linuxquestions.org or, I don't know, any other website. They would count on a support agreement with Red Hat, which is, which is tough to make. Insufficient marketing? Yeah, it, it is it's a true factor. Um, these five technological factors, actually this table is, ta is table number two, is one and three is missing here. Tough, tough discussion to go in. But these five factors are the main factors as um, perceived characteristics of innovation that companies are searching for. So relative advantage to the other softwares and, you, and tools in the um, market. Compatibility, complexity, trialability. Tri Trialability. I hate this word. Observability. So um, what happens is that if the way they use the software, the intention of the use they have is correlated with any of these five points, they are more likely to use it. But if not, um, they definitely are not going to use it. Um, if you want to have the slide later, you can read the, des the descriptions because it is kind of self-descriptive. And then we have organizational factors and environmental factors, as I told, I'm not going to go through them. It gets boring. But um, what is very important in here is um, TCO, total cost of ownership, because it, 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 it again comes down to total cost of ownership in the end when that person is making a decision. Because in business environment, one of the very, very, very important issues is money. And you have to show them that finally, in the end of the day, total cost of ownership of FOSS would be, would be at least equal or, or less than equal. Because if you say we're going to give you something for free, but then you have to pay 10 times more for education, for support, um, for maintenance time and, and stuff, your argument is not bought. Uh, and then top management support, which is very hard to get in this case. Environment is. Ah, and then a slot comes in, in this environmental factors. I've been I've been in interviews in the past two weeks, and in all of those interviews, there was someone who actually knew about a slug and, uh, and found out about that a slug line in my resume. I, I really didn't think that this idea of a slug would go into businesses and everyone in Sydney would, would have heard it somehow. So every time the guy said, oh, you go there, but this is still going on. I've heard of him like five years ago. So it shows that the notion of promoting the slug, as Patrick said, and then afterwards promoting Linux and then promoting FOSS actually helps this idea of FOSS adoption by businesses. Because if they know there is someone back there who supports them, who come together about this and talk about this, and it is some sort of important issue in the technical um, culture, then it actually helps because what I'm, what I'm arguing here is that all these factors are important, but in the end, that perception would make the final decision. That perception that everyone says, no, nah, let's just put a Windows for my grandma because it would, it would ha be helpful. This perception is out there. Even myself, when I was going to leave home, I said, no, let's just remove, remove the Linux on the desktop, have a nice Windows that everyone can come and help my mom when I'm not here. But that was a wrong perception because we all know that a very good, well-configured Linux, easy to use, can, can help my mom more because 
that windows is going to break down any day. No one is there to help. So what are we going to do in SLOG is to promote that perception inside the community on the internet so that the adoption takes place more frequently. And then some examples of big companies using it. Really not, not a good idea to go through it. But what is nice in here to know is the extent of OSS adoption. Because yes, they can use Eclipse and then they say, OK, they're using OSS. That's not enough. The extent of big businesses using it is, is sometimes huge. So in the literature, you can find really big examples. And you know, there's uh, about the perception. Um, many CTO and CEOs um, usually make decisions based on how their partners and friends make decisions. So we used to sell this software to a company in Sydney, and it was like $100,000 for them, nothing. But then the CEO had an American friend, and they had this meeting in some island for this mm, team building exercises. And then when the CEO came back, they paid $4 million for Salesforce. And then Salesforce was the worst idea on the market for them. But then you have a friend who is a CEO in America, and he tells you that's a very good choice to make. You're definitely going to choose that because it's, it's all about perceptions. It's all about network. W what about you feel rather than what is actually out there? For small decisions like an ID, it's a bit different, but same issue we talked about. Those four factors, one of them is missing. Long discussion. Uh, this is what I told you about. The intention to use and that um, perceived characteristic of innovation, if they correlate, then the outcome of perception is, is a positive perception of I, I want to use this software because what is out there is correlated with my intention to use it, it by the way I see it. So what you see here, no one talks about actual performance and usability of the software. So no one benchmarks Linux servers beside Windows servers and say, in our case, we're going to use Windows servers because by 0.2%, the benchmark is on our favor. Mostly, mostly in the academic literature, it all comes down to how they perceive it would work. So their intention to use it and, and the five factors or yeah, five because usability is up. The five factors of that software. This is a very nice table to look at. It was somehow the same um, a study done twice in 2005 and 2010. And uh, now that we know history and what happened in the past six, seven years, we know how this changed. You see, lack of relevance has dramatically dropped off because FOSS was not very much related. It was not in the news in 2005 that much. But up to 2010, by huge success of Red Hat and, and many, many, many other small FOSS applications who kind of grew up in the market and became big, it, it suddenly dropped because it was now relevant. They, they gave it a thought. And what is strange is that commitment to Microsoft is increased about twice. And I think that would be just interesting about those two. This is also good to know. Who is actually making that software selection decision in a company? N what we expect from an outsider point of view is that it would be triggered down on the person who is actually using it. And then it would go up on the hierarchy to the top management. So what happens is that the top management does everything by itself. No matter what, what people inside it believe, the decision is made by IT management and executives. You see, very, very little amount of that is about tech staff having all the others non-related combined. So combine them all together, and then it would come beside that. About, and, and it's a scale, um, yeah, it's a scale. So if you combine every one of them together, it would be much more than tech staff, because that tech staff part is the actual people involved using FOSS. But then combine them all together, it would go up there. 
this is I don't remember it. I don't remember it actually. I made it for uh, I made this for last month's meeting, so I don't remember actually what the scale was. Sorry. Um. This shows right perceived as being granted. So, to to what extent do they know what rights do they get by having a license? So about proprietary software, 81% of them actually know what rights they have on that software, and then 6% of them are unsure, but yet 13% of them have no idea what kind of rights they get. This is, this is fairly reasonable, we understand that, but it gets very bad Bruce Phillips? Yep. Yes, th th that, that was the point of showing it because about proprietary software, about 81% of people know what kind of rights they have. Yeah, they have no rights. So it, it gets really sad when it comes to FAS because more than 40% of people out there have no idea what kind of rights they get by coming into fast licenses. Looking at it from a business point of view, when a top manager who is going to make a decision on fast adoption have no idea what the license is, we will definitely not make a very, very good decision. And then we have to be there to define that free, in, free and open source software frame. So the first time I saw this, I was like, oh no. Because certainly that's a fail, fail for the market. 40% of managers and people out there have no idea what kind of rights they get by false licenses, and, and we are still trying to promote those licenses. It's a big fail, and trust me, it's not a fail for them. It's mainly a fail for us, guys who are promoting those licenses. Then we go to another subject in software selection process, and that's how systematic ITIL-based that software selection is. And then, again, more than 40% of the adoptions are not based on any well-known structure and framework of software selection. So somebody comes and says, okay, we have these four choices, and another person says, yeah, I know that, that works. And then they choose it. Perception and attitude and beliefs pay more attention. Sorry, sorry, go again. Uh, I think I think N is not the sample size. Ooh. Very hard for me to say since I read this paper about two months ago, but I don't know. I don't know. I have to look up. But it was, it was a very bigger a study as I remember that. I don't know what that N is. It may have been. <laughs> no, I really don't know what that is. Sorry. And then we go to pro Oh, this is even worse. <laughs> now I think of any every time I look at this picture. Um, this is even worse because the method of software selection goes to being 60% ad hoc or, or actually no method, same thing. Um, it may have been the number of people responded to that question. Okay, so yes, it would be the sample size but in that big sample size, the number of people who responded to that, because these numbers in this graph doesn't add up to the numbers in last graph, although they are somehow on the same subject. So what we see here is that, again, 60% of um, 
adoptions are, are, are based on an ad hoc method or, an, or no method at all, which is what the issue of perception comes in again. So if there is no method, they, they are going to choose based on the perceptions they have. And then the result would be, yeah, everyone is using Internet Explorer in businesses in Australia. I think this was a 2009 study in big businesses in here. So, yeah, when the software selection process inside that system would be like that, we expect to get everyone using IE after that in that business. So, operating system use. And then the factors, as I told you, how they how they affect. You see what, and this was for the 2005 one, by the way. So what we did somehow successfully was to cut that lack of relevance to half, but then we can still do more. So basically, that's it. Um, yeah, there was something very important I forgot to say about perceptions. It was a very good example. I got distracted, but. Um, the main the main idea of this talk in S-Log is that we, we shouldn't forget how we can affect the market which we relate to it somehow and how that market actually brings the money back to FOSS which would be the power beside everything. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Bobek, for giving us that interesting talk. Um, How are we going for time? Or um, has the other Patrick, who's not you, turned up? So the Patrick that is not Patrick um, has not turned up. So we might as well. Um, is that sorry? What's your name? Marco is giving a lightning talk on. Yep. And I um I'm going to talk about the Linux lightweight containers, LXC. And I think it's sorry. So he's gonna talk about Linux lightweight, Linux lightweight containers. And we'll get him a mic in a second. Mark? Perfect. Everybody able to hear me? Yeah, fine. And I'm going to uh, show you today um, some basics about uh, Linux lightweight, lightweight containers. Um, actually, uh, some time in the past, I ran over the need that I want to get rid of the VMware virtualization system. Uh, I had some Linux servers running, and I said, OK, I want something that is, has not too much overhead. and um, I just, um, uh, yeah. Okay, we will do it that way. Um, and I prepared a laptop totally. It's, it's a, a Debian system, a, a setup from scratch, and you're able to. Um, and actually, yeah, um, um, I found it really interesting because I wanted to get rid of the virtualization servers like the VMware, and I set it up. With, an, um, with Debian, I had a lot of Debian servers running on one system, and I wanted one solution that doesn't have so much overhead. And 2009 started to do, I, I came actually over this um, solution, and it's a system um, um,
Okay. Um, okay. It's just, I've just set up and you're not able to see anything, right? Well, then I think that doesn't make sense too because I have to show you all these things and No, there's nothing on that machine. No, it's just. Okay. No, there's nothing wrong. It's just I set it up to to show people um how to get it on running really easily, and it's just and that old lap I took that old laptop, installed it, and just maybe you should wait until next week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry for that. So, <laughs> I'm going to get um, <laughs> Marco will give us a talk next week when we can get a working projector for him. Um, next month, sorry, not next week. Um, Patrick, do you have any closing remarks? No, no, I don't. Just uh, everybody have a think about um, what you can do with space. Yes, so definitely come along and help participate. Um, even just coming along to things is good, so you've already got a gold star there. <laughs>